And they don't claim it's a, that they're maximizing his talent, but I'd claim it's a waste of talent. I don't think it's a smart move. And I don't know why the linebacker coach is even a part of the evaluation unless I'm missing something because he's the only one that seemed to know about it. He told Bo not to say anything. He said, then he says in the public setting it was widely known. Then he says on social media it was it was obvious that he was going to move and Critchlow was going to be the, the future of BYU. And then when you realize that land recruited Critchlow, then you start to smell. It doesn't smell good. You know, coaches like that to me are weasels on staffs. Pac-12, panic room, plus BYU, plus USU, plus Weaver, J.P. Chunga, Mitch Harper. Merrill Hodge called him a weasel. <laughs> Unbelievable. This is what we needed in the dog days of fall camp, J.P. We needed this to happen. We needed an angry, disgruntled ex-NFL player parent to be calling coaches a weasel. Un- unbelievable. Amazing. <laughs> He went Yasiel Puig on the entire BYU coaching staff, on the entire BYU football team. It was amazing. And you're talking about a guy that genuinely liked. He's the only guy on earth that liked BYU's offense last year compared to what they might become. We don't even know what they're going to be this year, but he hates it already. He just he was all in on the pro-style offense with tight ever. He was the only guy. I know. That liked what they were doing last year, which was the worst offense since World War II. But don't tell that to Merrill Hodge. He loved every bit of it because it was pro style. It's, I guess it's that NFL in him, I guess. Your initial reactions to hearing the interview, hearing the way he reacted when Bo made the switch, his reaction was he wasn't happy about it because he wants Bo to be a quarterback. Yeah, my first thought was, this is on BYU TV. They didn't hit the I know. button. I know. I mean, we're producers for the Bill Riley show. I do that 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Monday through Friday. You're with Gunther and Ben. Yeah. Sometimes you got to go to that dump. Like oh, yeah. You got to you hit that dump button. We, we're on a. We'll just go a little bit behind the curtain here. Yep. Ten second delay. Yeah. So you guys, when you come in, you think you want to give a hot take to Bill. Well, it's a ten second delay, and I can hit that dump. Same with JP. Mm-hmm. That's what I thought BYU would have done because you know that's the brand. That's the yeah. cool. But you know they kind of went hot take on us, and they allowed Merrill Hodge to. To really, it seemed like almost pull a switcheroo because it's like yeah. the host of the show. I like those guys, Jason Shepard, Spencer Linton, but it almost felt like you know they maybe told Merrill some questions and and then he just totally switched yeah. the script on them. And I don't I don't think they knew how to react, but my reaction was, wow, this is incredible. And really, did he think that his son should have been the starter? I I, I just thought it was it's a combination of angry parent, but also. It made me pause and maybe reflect on how, how why is a defensive coach maybe having conversations with a quarterback on switching to running back? So interesting dynamic, and to be an ex NFL guy it just makes it all that more interesting. Bo called me up. He said, "If you pull out our twelfth grade youth football team, you'll find all these plays." He goes, "Exactly what we did with with him actually in in youth football." So I don't know. You know, I just I, you know, coaches say a lot of things. I looked at it. I mean, obviously, he's, he's a mad parent. That's going to happen, okay? But the way I also viewed it was, like, qu- playing quarterback nowadays, it's like picking up the violin. A parent invests a coach in you. You have to go to practice on your own with the coach. It's playing the violin. And this parent, Merrill Hodge, who is a big platform, having been on ESPN and been an analyst, he viewed that as – wow, I just wasted a lot of money on my kid to be a quarterback, and now they're moving him to running back? And then on top of that, a linebacker's coach is telling my son that he's going to be switching, and then they're not allowing him to compete? I saw from Merrill Hodge just a lot of that mm, Papa Bear trying to protect the Cub from him, and and he was just so disappointed that they didn't allow Bo to compete at quarterback. That's a great comparison with violin lessons because those things – those are a lot. I mean, yeah. from personal experience, the clarinet, I was not good, but <laughs> yeah. I threw a lot of money at it, and they were ticked when I did fall through and, and become an excellent clarinet player. Yes, I was a clarinet guy. I had the little, it was like, kind of like this mic. It was like this. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I think with, uh, with Bo Hodge, though, I, I think this is a, it was fascinating to see this dynamic, and I kind of wonder, how does Bo Hodge move forward from this? Because Or Tristan. 
Yeah, it's it's just an interesting... A little bit, but you know, Bo not Hodges, the same. Bo Hodges, I thought, handled it great on Twitter. I thought that was probably the best way, because he kind of owned up to not telling his dad maybe the whole story a little bit. I thought that was commendable. I don't think you win when you have to go to notes on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> there, There is no <laughs> position in the world that you have saved something when you have to go to notes. Like, if you have to put text on your Instagram story, nope, <laughs> you lost. <laughs> it's over. I, I'm sorry for a blank. Nope. Ball game. It's over. That's very true because usually that's always a, a, a bad announcement or yeah. something trying to trying to get people to win you over again. But I thought it was okay. But still, I think that, you know, with Bo Hodge and, and this whole dynamic, I, I think with Tr- Merrill Hodge, I thought he made an interesting point about, you know, why is Ed Lamb, you know, discussing this with my son? And I think Merrill Hodge was just upset over the fact of those quotes that got leaked a few weeks back. Before fall camp in what was it down in St. George, yeah. Ed Lamb spoke down to some BYU alums and mm-hmm. didn't know mics were hot apparently. Yeah. And his quotes of, you know, Joe Critchell might be one of the all time greats at BYU. And then that quote combined with the fact that he told Bo that you're gonna go to running back, that's where maybe Merrill Hodge, that's what set him off. And it's just been boiling for weeks. And then he got that platform and took it to another level because angry quarterback dads that's common. Yeah. That's commonplace. I mean, John Beck's dad, he had kind of a helicopter dad. I mean, it just it happens where mm-hmm. guys are involved at every practice, but you usually don't see that angry helicopter dad go to the media and really just let it rip, man. Just let it <laughs> Let it rip. Let, let it rip. rip. <laughs> let it fly and, and let it fly Merrill Hodge did. And it's not like as if he's going from quarterback to another glamour position. There really is no other switch from quarterback that is comparable because it's such a singular position. You you don't go live at times in practice for a reason because they're trying to protect you. Having a switch from a D lineman to an offensive lineman, okay, you know, that, that can go. But a quarterback to a running back, one of the most exposed positions in, in football in general – it's very interesting, to say the least, from BYU. He took us behind the curtain, yeah. definitely. Well, and also, too, I mean, it's also interesting in the fact that, you know, Bo Hodge had a lot of injuries, concussions, mm-hmm. foot injury, and you go, does the running back, is that better for a guy that's got a history in, of, of concussions? I mean, his father, Merrill Hodge, a lot of concussions in the NFL. So that's where maybe it's a little bit uh, unusual. But, yeah, the quarterback position is just one that, Everyone feels like this should start. That's why you see so many yeah. transfers in college football. But I thought Ed Lamb handled it professionally on uh, on Thursday when he was adri- asked by the media about his thoughts on what he heard. The always the the head coach and the special teams coordinator are all at mo- on most every team going to be the guys making uh, a lot of the early decisions about um, where we look at personnel. And, and the reason for that is the special teams coordinator works with every single player on the roster. There's no player on this roster that doesn't have a daily job in the special teams area, and except the, the exception to that would be you know, the, the quarterbacks. But when we talk about uh, having a large depth chart, chart at quarterbacks, and, and guys look at which players can move and help the team at another position. And so I'm, I'm generally involved in those conversations. It's not particular to BYU. It's not particular to, to me. It's a, it's, a, it's a special teams coordinator duty at all schools. And he even mentioned that from guys three to five at any spot, uh, they kind of look at other options for them. But what makes it weird is that Bo Hodge was the only quarterback last year above Tanner Mangum, above Joe Critchell, that gave any sort of big playability at the mm-hmm. quarterback position. And I even thought personally, I thought that in spring, uh, he was maybe the second best quarterback. We didn't see Tanner go live at all. But, you know, I thought Bo looked pretty good. But, you know, coaches obviously thought differently. They thought he was at best third. And he wasn't going to beat Zach Wilson, wasn't going to beat Tanner Mangum. Maybe he could have beat Joe Critchlow. But then they thought, he's one of our best athletes. Let's get him on the field. And it seems like he's been doing okay at running back. But... It's a hard transition to expect him to contribute to that spot when he's never really played it since fifth grade. You called him Taysom Hill light, yep. you know, a little bit in that in that aspect, and and we sort of observed that obviously last year. Utah State game's a great great one to point out for Bo Hodge, just in that ability to be Taysom Hill esque, and unfortunately, he's just not going to be at the quarterback position 
uh, going forward for BYU. Looking at the storylines ending fall camp as they transition to actually having school to deal with and having practices at a different time, a better time for the afternoon show, which is good for me. Uh, BYU, they have obviously this big quarterback competition. When do you think that it is going to be settled there? You know, honestly, it, I think it might get settled by Monday, but will they tell it to the media? Mm-hmm. That's maybe the question. We might not find out until the first snap against Arizona or get some leak uh, you know, to the media. Usually it does somehow get leaked mm-hmm. uh, to the media, but I think I think BYU's got to decide uh, and really rally around one guy if they really want to start to create that identity. Probably 10 days out, I would think, is when you have to name somebody as the starter and be able to get behind them as the leader of the team. Uh, do you have a favorite in the race between Tanner Mangum and Zach Wilson? For me, no question, Zach Wilson. Yep. I think if all things were equal, age, experience, Zach Wilson, this isn't even a debate. But the fact that we're talking about a 25-year-old and an 18-year-old, it's the most extremes you'll ever find in a college football yeah. quarterback race. And that, combined with the crazy, tough September schedule, it maybe makes BYU pause and go, do we want to set, is he ready for that fire of Arizona, of Cal, Wisconsin, Washington? I mean, some two teams in there that could be college football playoff teams by season's end, do we want to throw them into that? Because... With or without, whether it's Tanner Mangum or Zach Wilson, I think BYU is probably losing maybe three of those games at least. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, if those are severe losses, blowouts, and Zach Wilson's the quarterback, does that rattle his confidence? Because that's the one thing that stood out in fall camp. He's a confident kid. If you take some beatings and games, are you still that confident kid and you're still thinking, hey, I can, I can be a great quarterback? And that's maybe where there's some – teetering as far as how Jeff Grimes and the staff wants to handle it. But statistically speaking, it's from what I've been hearing is that completion percentage, Zach Wilson's been the better quarterback. And that's a huge per- a statistic that Grimes has said to myself that he's going to look at. His stats are going to be important in this decision. And Zach Wilson has got a little bit of an edge in the statistical category through fall camp. And Zach Wilson will be taking on the 12th 12- 12-year-old playbook, I guess, exactly. if you're talking to Merrill Hodge uh, of Jeff Grimes. I thought that was also another indictment, the fact that he went after the offensive uh, playbook and the way that they're calling plays for Bo Hodge. Oof, it yeah. was just a train wreck for Merrill. Bad look, bad look all around. <laughs> a little bit quieter for Utah, obviously, up on the hill. Uh, no drama today. I was down there uh, at Rice Eccles Stadium. They actually had us also with the freshmen – uh, who were going onto the field to, I believe, take pictures uh, for their first day at college. And, yeah, nothing nothing to report from Utah practice other than they went through a walkthrough of what it'll be like on game day. They're pretty settled, and it's pretty quiet for the Utes as they head into another year in the Pac-12 with finally expectations at that Pac-12 South title. Well, it seems like Kyle Whittingham really likes this football team as well, and and you look at guys that there's a ton of talent on this team. I think that's that's not just tongue-in-cheek. I mean, now you're, what, year eight in the Pac-12. You are seeing legitimate twos and threes, or guys that are competitive. And they're, it's competitive depth where you're seeing guys making the ones better. And I think that's something that's really standing out with this Utah team. But I think also, too, you know, I, I really have high expectations for Zach Moss and what he does mm-hmm. this year. I was talking on the Bill Riley show with Bill and I think that he's someone that very easily, if he has a big year this year, he's looking at the NFL next season. He's going to be very difficult. What do we see on Twitter today? Was it uh, uh, Terrell Burgess uh, tweets out that he could? Yeah. He can't tackle Zach Moss. <laughs> nope. He can't stop him. I don't think really anyone can. He's going to be really good this year. But it has been kind of a, a business as usual feel up at Camp Kyle, um, which which is a good thing because you you stayed healthy. But you're also getting the expectations, and it doesn't seem like it's getting to their head, and it feels like Kyle Whittingham is really uh, excited about this group. It's, he's kind of made it very well known. Like, he feels comfortable in his job. He likes his new leadership, I'm sure, and uh, in the athletic department. I think that Kyle Whittingham is just really excited to see what this team can do and seeing that there is a clear opening in the Pac-12 South for them to finally maybe do it. I guess the only news was that they're going to be voting for captains. We didn't yeah. get a... Uh, key in on who is going to be the captain, but they do it on an app. That's really cool. 
did you think in any time that they would be voting for captains on an app? I was talking to Kyle Gunther. They voted on like a tablet back in the old days. It was written on stone who you wanted to vote for. He was so old. Um, captains over at Utah and BYU. I guess they're being done on apps. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I think that's just continues to shows the technological advances in these kids about screens and and that's where that's where it's going kids are going to do everything on, on their screens with these college kids and whether it's Fortnite or captains they're going to be on front of a screen uh, making their decisions in life but it, it's unique and i think a guy like tyler huntley is someone yeah. that probably gets named a, a captain i would expect i mean we heard uh jim rome the interview where he, kyle would jim rome is not on the market anymore but uh, he used to be at a, a previous station that... Uh, we won't mention that. We won't, we won't mention that. <laughs> That's but, another uh, video. <laughs> another, another time and another life for us uh, back in the day. But, Shout out to Tyson. <laughs> Voice of the Grizz. Hey, yeah, home, home of the Grizz here on ESPN 700. But, uh, he, you know, even Kyle Whittingham mentioned Tyler Huntley, his competitive spirit yeah. and how he just wants to be... Just, he's kind of relentless in that way. He just gets everyone better. I would imagine the way that he's really taken ownership of that number one spot. Because, I, again, I thought that going into camp, maybe Jack Tuttle can make a case because yeah. he's so good. And that's such a unique dynamic that Utah has never juggled in their program. Getting a quarterback like Jack Tuttle and the accolades that he has, it almost makes you go, do, do they feel like they need to elevate him up the depth chart? But, uh, you know, we could see Jack Tuttle maybe next week when the depth chart comes out as number three. I mean, it's possible. It's, it's You can make a case for that. So... I think he probably ends up at two, but the emergence of Huntley just taking ownership of the offense, having it be his team, year two under Troy Taylor, I think that's been a, a, one of the notable stories from Camp Kyle. Lo Falamaka, another opportunity yeah. to be a guy in the captaincy, and then defensively, obviously, you have to look at Chase. He can rent a car, for goodness sake. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, he can rent a car. He's, he's got to be a captain. He has a mortgage to pay off, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Maybe he doesn't need the captain uh, <laughs> as well to... Give him gray hairs. I don't know if he has gray hairs yet. Yes. We got to check on that. Uh, Chase Hansen, obviously, at linebacker. And then you could even go Lucky Fotu or somebody in the secondary like Corian Ballard. Yeah, Lucky Fotu, interesting note on him. We had a uh, college football insider, Rich Serminiello. Sermin I, I got to get the pronunciation on that right. It's tongue twister there. But he said he talked with a lot of NFL GMs in the past few weeks. Lucky Fotu considered a surefire First round talent in the mm -hmm. NFL, Lucky Foto. So even NFL teams are starting to see the potential of what he can be. It's just this could be a huge year for Lucky Foto and his draft prospects. We could see him being discussed like Lowell. Lowell Tulele yep. was after his junior year. I remember he was going to be a projected first round pick and then comes back for his senior year and now he's retired from football. But uh, Lucky Foto going to be a huge, huge difference maker on that defense line. I almost feel like. The other defensive tackle spot, whoever it ends up being, whether it's Puta Teo or, or someone else, um, I don't think it really matters mm -hmm. because Lecky Foto is just that dominant of a force in, in the interior of that defensive line. Bradley and I, Julian Blackman, there are so many people to look at as far as captains on the defensive side. We won't uh, waste time on special teams because... Exactly. Uh, looking at the Pac-12, because this is the Pac-12 panic room, plus BYU, plus B USU, plus Weber... You did a blog on ESPN700sports.com about the quarterbacks in the Pac-12, and I want to go through it a little bit, starting from the bottom, because that's, that's where we are. Then we'll get here. Starting at the bottom, Oregon State, Jake Luton, the quarterback for the Beavers. You've got him ranked at the bottom of the Pac-12. Yeah, it feels like the, the theme with Oregon State. Just yeah. everything for that program as a whole is at the bottom. I like Jonathan Smith. I think he'll get the most out of Luton, but... I think that uh, Oregon State is just everything about that is literally at rock bottom in this conference. Mm -hmm. It's even the quarterback play. It's just going to be a slog for that team. It'll be a miracle if they get three wins uh, this year. Second to last, Gardner Minshew, the transfer over at Washington State for Mike Leach. A little low for a Mike Leach quarterback, right? Well, that's the thing is that I mean, you think of all the quarterbacks that Leach has had. I mean what Connor Holiday, Luke Falk was once a walk on, he always gets production from that spot. So but I think right now where we stand in the season, uh he's still in a quarterback battle right now, Minshew and at what they call a Camp Cougar up in Lewiston, Idaho up there, Washington State. Um I just think right now at this juncture of the off or in training camp, um I don't I can't justify him any higher than that. But mm -hmm. by season's end, 
we'll have this as a weekly. I'll put this up on ESPN 700 Sports every week, kind of a power rankings of, of the quarterback. I mean, that's the theme of this show. It's it's a, it's power rankings. Power we, rankings. We love the rankings. Uh, but you'll see Minshew move up. But right now, I think he's 11. He doesn't suck, as uh, Jalen Ramsey would say. That's right. <laughs> At year's end, he doesn't suck. Uh, 10, this one I was a little bit questionable about because you're going over to Stanford and K.J. Costello. Yeah, K.J. Costello, former four-star recruit. I mean, only a sophomore, got a little bit of time last year. I just For, for me, at Stanford, it's all about the running attack. He's fortunate. Mm-hmm. He's got Bryce Love behind it. But I think Costello, uh, I'm just not sold on Stanford at all. And, Co- no. and a lot of it is because of Costello. I just don't buy into him uh, at all as like a Stanford quarterback that we've seen in the past that – can really be a, a playmaker. I think he's just a game manager. I think he's a poor man's Kevin Hogan. And Kevin Hogan was uh, a really a solid quarterback, but he was, he'd have some Kevin Hogan years with eight and four, just kind of pedestrian mm-hmm. Stanford seasons. And I think that's kind of KJ Costell. That's what he he is more so for. So for me, I got him at ten. I see him how well he played last year, just towards the start of it, and then he had to deal with Keller Christ splitting time. That affects how he's going to play on the field that we didn't see the best of K.J. Costello last year. I thought he was the most dynamic player that came into Rice-Eccles Stadium as far as a Stanford quarterback. Last year I was in the press box sitting next to Kyle and Tom, and though, and he was really dialing it up with those RPOs, those run-pass options, read options, uh, actions with Bryce Love. He has such an advantage by obviously having Bryce Love, but he's a danger with his, his feet as well. Yeah, I mean, he's got the pedigree. His background, like it says, recruit. But again, I just think that he's going to be at best a game manager, and I think that that might be good enough for, Pat, right. for Stanford to be right there next to Washington in the Pac-12 North. I mean, their project is the number two team, but I just think there's a lot of good quarterbacks in this mm-hmm. league, um, and that's why I put him in where he's at right right now going into the season. He'll have quite the test uh, heading into the start of his Pac-12 play because he starts against USC yeah. up at the farm. After K.J. Costello, ninth-ranked Pac-12 quarterback, you picked a winner at UCLA, something that they don't have. You picked Wilton Spate. I don't know if he's going to be winning the job. I don't know if he'll take all the snaps this year because he's battling out with Dorian Thompson-Robinson. But why Wilton Spate at nine? Yeah, Wilton Spate kind of reminds me a little bit of the Jim Harbaugh situation at Michigan when his first year, Jake Rudolph came in. Grad it's true. Transfer, big time pro, big profile head coach. I think Chip Kelly's going to get a lot more out of this offense than I think people think going into this season. If people are kind of low on UCLA. Chip Kelly was really standoffish at Pac-12 Media Day. I wasn't impressed with that, but that's that's Chip Kelly. He's not mm-hmm. the the most easy on the edges. That's why boosters really didn't like him at Oregon. Uh, but I think he's going to eventually choose Spate. Like you said, you got the freshman DTR, uh, as they call him out in Westwood. But I, I think that Wilton Spate, again, he came in as a great, comes in from Michigan. It reminds me a lot of that Rudock situation with Michigan uh, when Harbaugh's first year in 2015. And I think like that Michigan team, I, I don't know if they'll be a 10-win team like UCLA, mm-hmm. but I think Wilton Spate can be good enough to where he's executing Chip Kelly's offense. Cause I, I just try, It's maybe a byproduct more so of Chip Kelly, mm-hmm. and I think he'll get the most out of Wilton Spate because it's untapped potential right now. He, and – it can only help DTR if he's going to wait a year to allow Wilton Spade. He may also get, obviously, snaps if things don't go right for UCLA this year. After Wilton Spade, JT Daniels at USC coming in as your eighth quarterback in the Pac-12. This kid's legit. He's going to be yeah. so good. I can't wait to see this guy in action. JT Daniels is really Really good. I mean, five-star kid reclassified was supposed to be a 2019 kid, but I think JT Daniels is is really going to be special. And I I don't want to say significant or uh, it's a uh, not much of a drop from Sam Darnold, but JT Daniels is very similar to that of like a Josh Rosen. He's kind of like a political kid. Mm-hmm. He's very outspoken. I'm really Buddhist. excited with him. I think this is going to be. He's a heck of a talent. He's going into that camp at, at Troy and. And really kind of wowed everyone. And he's really taken a hold where, kind of like what we were talking about with BYU, uh, a true freshman leading the way. But with Daniels, this was the number one recruit in America. And, and he's showing that talent. I, I think he's going to be fantastic. I wouldn't be surprised by, by season's end. He's one of the three or four best quarterbacks in the conference. I think he's that good. I was going to say, because 
And think about this for USC. They might have two freshmen yeah. leading them with Amon Ross St. Brown. Mm -hmm. Every single camp report is JT Daniels threw a touchdown to Amon Ross St. Brown on a 60-yard go route. Amazing. Amazing what he's doing as a first-year player against the ones because they can do that at USC, ones versus ones. It's tremendous stuff from JT Daniels. He will be moving up this list come season's end. Seventh-rated quarterback in the Pac-12, Cal Ross Bowers. Yeah, Ross Bowers, like this Cal team. Uh, yeah. This is a team that could be pretty good. He lost one of his big targets in Demetrius Robertson, who got yeah. cleared to play at Georgia. Kind of a unique situation there. But, uh, and that was a big loss uh, for Cal. But I really like Bowers. You go look at his stats. Last season, Cal was 5-7. and seven. They had all five of their wins were against Power 5 teams. Or, excuse me, four of their five pet wins that were against Power 5 teams. Uh, that was pretty notable, I thought, especially two of them in the non-conference. But I thought Bowers, uh, over 3,000 yards again, even though it felt like there was a dip in production, but that was just because that air raid offense with Sonny Dykes and Jared Goff and, and then um, the transfer that they got in from, I'm drawing a blank right now, that grad transfer they had in oh. between Goff and Bowers. Oh, yeah, I know. He had talking. the photo where he was on ESPN. He's, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Point. Let's play that here. But, uh, Downloading the photo right now. <laughs> It is right here, yes. as you can see. It's right there. But uh, <laughs> but I think that Bowers' is, uh, production is going to put up some big numbers. He's going to do a nice job. And I think also, too, that Justin Wilcox, second year uh, at, at Cal, I think that Ross Bowers is just a solid quarterback. I, I, I think he's a guy that probably stays here the entire year, mm -hmm. kind of middle range of the Pac-12. I don't think he's elite by any means, but I think he's just a solid quarterback that – might pull off some upsets or two potentially in this in this league. They were so close last year. Three point losses to Stanford and UCLA, and then a one point shootout loss to Arizona. They were close to being uh, not only a bowl team but an upper echelon Pac-12 team. Sixth, right in the middle, Tyler Huntley up at Utah, yeah. Pac-12 quarterbacks. Got to stay healthy this year. We we were talking about Huntley. He's taking ownership of that offense. I think he's in the top half of the, of the quarterbacks in this league. But he's got to stay healthy. I'm very interested to see what he does in the run game this year. How much involved is he in that? Whittingham has said that that's still going to be part of his game, but I just always think you got to err on the side of caution. Our guy Kyle Gunther even always says you can't. You know, they're just not going to last. They're not going to last <laughs> again as mobile quarterback. But uh, that's going to be interesting. But I think Huntley, um, his skill set, and I think that also uh, his pedigree, too, coming out of Florida. He was mm -hmm. one of the Florida players of the year, and he was, for some yep. reason or another, not highly recruited and – you know, Dennis Erickson gets these Hallandale kids to Utah, and they're all performing well. He's got a great connection with Damari Simpkins. Uh, it, Huntley's definitely, to me, in warranting of being in the top six, but he's six right now, and I think he could move up over the course of the season. He can move up if I'm getting the Washington Huntley, but if I'm getting the Arizona Huntley, There's obviously he can go down. Uh, fifth rated Pac-12 quarterback, Manny Wilkins at ASU. This is the only reason where you maybe pause and think that the – Herm experiment could might, maybe not be an utter disaster in year one because Manny Wilkins is a really good quarterback. And he had some great wins last year. I mean, he mm -hmm. won at Utah. One of the greatest two-week stretches I've ever seen in college football. Beating Washington and then winning at Utah in dominating fashion. I, you yeah. don't see Utah get dominated very often. Uh, that was one of the more dominating performances by an opponent against Utah that I've seen in some time. And Manny Wilkins was that quarterback. So when we, we predict... Arizona State is the sixth best team in the Pac-12 South, the media at, at Pac-12 Media Day. I almost I, I get leery of that a little bit just because Manny Wilkins maybe can overcome the just the preacher-like mentality of, of Herm Edwards. Football. Uh, and he also has Nikhil Harry. That has to help him out. Uh, Fourth-rated quarterback in the Pac-12, Stephen Montez, Colorado. Interesting prospect as well. I mean, he's big in size. What, 6'5", Stephen Montez. Really good quarterback. And Colorado, to me, I, I can't get a good feel of what they could be. Uh, I don't think they're going to be winning the South like they did two mm -hmm. years ago. But th I don't think they're going to be just a – I think they could be back in bowl – go back to a bowl game in large part because of Steven Montez. And, and I think this offense, it's kind of like a do-or-die season for Mike McIntyre. But I think he's got to feel confident knowing he's got Montez at, at slinging the rock. I don't think it's a do-or-die uh, year for Mike McIntyre. We'll hear more of that next time we're in the panic room because I'll be coming out with a coaches on the hot seat because expectations at Colorado, it's a party school, as Kyle Gunther says. I don't have high expectations for the Buffs. Third-rated quarterback in the Pac-12, 
Some people say he is the best pro prospect in the league, Justin Herbert at Oregon. And that's going to be kind of like what we heard with Josh Rosen in every, mm-hmm. every game. He's an NFL quarterback, but, you know, so yeah. that's what we're going to hear a lot with Justin Herbert broadcast this season. But I do think he is probably the best pro prospect. I want to see him stay healthy, though. He hasn't played a full mm-hmm. season yet at Oregon, but all the ability in the world to – to really make this offense go. I mean, without Justin Herbert, Oregon's offense just took a significant dip. Mm -hmm. With him, though, they were averaging, what, close to 40 points a game. They were nearly unstoppable. So Herbert has shown when he's playing that this offense is really, really good. Mario Cristobal's got a ton of momentum in that Oregon program right now. They've been one of the, the hot programs in college football when it comes to recruiting. Let's see if they can actually capitalize that now on the season. They got amazing jerseys. I'm, I'm a fan. I love them. I'm I love them. Those big numbers, people are hating on them. I love the creativity. They continue to be on the cutting edge with jerseys. It's amazing. It reminds me of the color rush jerseys in the NFL. Uh, I love what they're, they're doing. Great. They're they're way better than the Notre Dame pinstripe yeah. jerseys. No question. Those <laughs> pinstripes, those gotta go. But the Oregon ones, I, it's amazing. They've been doing this what since Joey Harrington in New yep. York. The billboards, it's like you would think that they'd lose steam and not be cutting edge and exciting anymore, but they just continue to churn out that sauce, that swag that the kids like. <laughs> then they're going to their tablets, and yep. their, their their phones, their apps, and voting that, oh, yeah, this is lit. This is this is the, <laughs> this is the jersey we're going to wear, man. It's dab, great. dab, dab. Dab, dab, dab. Fire emoji, fire emoji. <laughs> Justin Herbert also has a great schedule for him. Yeah. Uh, cupcakes in the non-conference, and then... All the big teams, most of them are, are in Odson. Yeah. Uh, that'll help them out. Could be a good year for Oregon. Second best quarterback in the Pac-12, according to Mitch Harper, Jake Browning at Washington. Yeah, Jake Browning. I think it's a case of we know what he is. I don't think he can get much significantly better than what he's been in his career. I mean, from that first game against Boise State as a true freshman on the blue and to where he's become, Jake Browning's a heck of a quarterback. It's weird that there's a pocket of Washington fans that – that want him gone or want him benched for some I know. reason or other. They hate him. Can't win the big game. Yeah. Can't win the big game, Softy. I don't know if I can rely on him. <laughs> I like Jake Browning, though. He's a heck of a quarterback. I don't know if he's necessarily an NFL quarterback. I, I don't I don't yeah. know if he's a guy that translates, but that doesn't matter here at college football. He's a dang good Washington quarterback, and he's revived a program that now is the premier program out west. I mean, Washington is the it thing even better than USC, in my opinion, just because of the coaching with Chris Peterson. Jake Browning is going to do great things, but I just think he is what he is, and that's what maybe maybe I, that what made me put him at number two. And what's great about this for your power rankings? You're going to know a lot about Jake Browning come week one. Week oh, yes. one, week one, he's got Auburn. You'll see all of the shots for Jake Browning yeah. in that game, and whether he can win the big game, softy, check it out. That means number one, Khalil Tate out of Arizona as the number one Pac-12 quarterback, according to you. I love Khalil Tate. I think Khalil Tate is a fantastic quarterback. I mean, Sports Illustrated what named him the best quarterback in college football. I think Khalil Tate, uh, what he showed in the, the bowl game against Purdue, as far as passing the football, over 300 yards passing in that one, I thought that was some, some positive momentum going into the offseason. And then there was a scare, possibly, of having what was it, the Navy coach, Ken Niamatololo. Mm-hmm. And he single-handedly Amazing. sabotaged the hire, <laughs> Amazing. Uh, which is remarkable. And I, credit to him, because just being honest about it, not saying I'm going to run the triple option. Hell no, <laughs> I'm not doing that. And But I think he's going to be great with Kevin Sumlin. It's yeah. not just because of Johnny Manziel either. I mean, Kevin Sumlin's been good with a lot of quarterbacks. I mean, Case Keenum, at, when he was at Houston, Case Keenum under Kevin Sumlin was one of the best quarterbacks in the history mm-hmm. of college football. And then his last years were with Art Browse, but... Kevin Sumlin was what got Case Keenum rolling uh, in H-Town, and and he just got a great pedigree of developing quarterbacks. Kevin Sumlin got Noel Mazzoni as the offensive coordinator. I think Khalil Tate is going to be off the charts. He's going to be dynamite. He's going to be he's going to be great. Hashtag Pac-12 after dark content. He's going to be gonna great. Love yeah, he's going to be fantastic. We're going to love him. We're oh, going to yeah. love him on this show. He's going to give us highlights to talk about. And I I read that Sports Illustrated story, and one of the highlighted like anecdotes was after the Utah game when he didn't have to face uh, the Utes. A Utes assistant comes over when they're doing the handshakes and says, "Glad we didn't have to play you." That's huge because exactly what you're looking for is Khalil Tate as a as a college quarterback. He's a running back playing quarterback, yeah. uh, no doubt. But in games against Washington State, in games against USC, he could pass enough 
to show that he's a capable quarterback and you don't have to just sell on the run every single time. He's going to be totally the guy where college football Twitter will, someone will tweet out a highlight and then they'll instantly turn, somehow find the Pac-12 network. I think this show is on more homes <laughs> than the Pac-12 network. But, I mean, I think it'll be, it's going to be fun. I mean, Khalil Tate's going to be a lot of fun this season. Uh, really excited to see him. I, I just feel like his ability to do it both through the air and on the ground that makes him the best quarterback in Pac-12. Disagree with Mitch's list? Comment below here on YouTube. Also, subscribe and like. Otherwise, I'll think you're a hater. For Mitch, I'm JP. This is the Pac-12 Panic Room plus BYU plus USU plus Weber. We're coming back on Monday with Coach's Hot Seats. See ya.